Hi, this is Dave Gianco from Yuba City, California, and I play at the River Oaks Golf Club. This is Golf Smarter, number 955. I work with more golfers with yips than anybody else on the planet. That's a certainty. And I have a very high success rate, and it's only getting better. My biggest success so far, I worked with a guy a year and a half ago in Hawaii when he was in high school, was the number one ranked junior in the country. At the time, he was playing with people like Scotty Scheffler and beating them. Very slowly, starting in senior year, he started getting full swing yips, and then he got a full ride to an Ivy League school, was the number one player in the Ivy League school's golf team. The yips slowly got worse over time. It got so bad by the end of his junior year, he had to quit the team. He couldn't play. And eventually quit golf. He would only yip on the golf course, not ever on the range. And he was hitting the ball so solid and so far with such a great looking swing that everybody on the range would stop and just stare at him. Even then, when he still had the yips, although again, not on the range, he would have been ranked one of the top 10 ball strikers in the world. That's how good the guy was. He shared with me that he played at the Presidio in San Francisco from the tips a week before he came out. And the yips were so bad, I think he shot 110. So imagine being one of the top 10 ball strikers in the world and shooting 110. That's how devastating the yips can be. So it took him a few months. He had to go home and do a lot of practice, but he started seeing some significant improvement in the reduction of the yips by the end of the third month. And he contacted me about six months ago. He was a zero handicap. He'll be probably a plus three by the end of the year. So there is hope. Even for a severe case like that, it's possible to overcome the yips. Insights and advice for greater distance and control with your driver off the tee. With Jim Waldron. This is Golf Smarter. Sharing stories, tips, and insights from great golf minds to help you lower your score and raise your golf IQ. Here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome back to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Jim. Thanks, Fred. Thank you for having me back for the 150th time. <laughs> you know, every time that you and I schedule something, I'm thinking, okay, I need to go back through my database and my spreadsheet and figure out how many times you've actually been on the show because you keep increasing it by fivefold exactly. each time we yeah. talk. Yeah, I'm a big exaggerator. I'm, I'm Irish, man. You know you know what the word Blarney means, right? That's, a, that's the no. Irish tendency to over-exaggerate everything, right? So. Oh. <laughs> yeah. My wife could tell you about, all about it. And what about the Irish goodbye? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Versus mine. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, but the most exciting thing is that we have, like, we started recording as soon as we started talking. Yeah, the curse is lifted. I, the Wolfgang Pauli curse, curse, also known as the Jim the Walter. Pauli. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we've never in all these years, every time that we get together, it's about 45 minutes of trying to figure out yep. how to get you on the line. Yeah, solid state intelligence doesn't like Jim Waldron and vice versa, yeah. Lord, by the way. <laughs> and and as, as a tech geek, let me just say this, Jim, yeah. is someone you've taught me so much. It's all mental, dude. If you're just making it up. You know, if it, it's all positive attitude. If you have the positive attitude yeah. and you don't fret over it, so, it's going to work. It's so fine. we turn into the Borg Empire and you're going to be saying to me in your best Borg impersonation, <laughs> resistance is futile. I'm supposed to just give in and go, yeah, you're right, Fred. Resistance is, no, it's not me. I'm going to be a member you know, of, of the Rebel Alliance when that happens, just so you know. So. <laughs> you, you and I and many people who are listening, uh, many who write to me regularly, we all remember thinking, wow, 1984, that's a long way away. <laughs> yeah, we're well past it. Well yeah. past that. Do you know there's a there's oh, a man. robot right now with an AI brain that in a I saw the conversation. It claims it's self-aware, and it didn't even use the word self-aware. Well, it did it initially. Then it said – I actually have a type of meta awareness, which is really creepy. Is it Swedish? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. yeah. I actually have. And it does Borscht a, Belt a comedy too. Swedish it does stand up comedy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but seriously, folks. But seriously. So do you. Take my computer, please. Yeah. Please. Yeah. And yours, especially. Get yeah, especially it out mine. Of here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of technology, where are we going with this? Yeah. Um, I, you know, one of the topics you wanted to, you suggested was about hitting, hitting your driver longer. And there's actually a couple of topics around the driver that I would love to discuss today. Okay. But, um, and one of them is, which seems to be very hot conversation going on these days. And that's that actress who's also a golf club, 
Mini Driver. Oh, <laughs> the Mini Driver. That's right. <laughs> yeah, Good Will Hunting, one of my favorite movies. Yeah. 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 But Mini Driver, people are talking about Mini Driver a lot. Um, what's your experience and your advice? I've never owned one. I have hit a couple of my students. I mean, I think it's only for really, really good players with a lot of club head speed, which is like not most of your listeners. But yeah. I understand the concept. You know, back in the day, and way back in the day, there was a club called a number two wood, also known as a brassy, the original right. name. I had one. My first set of clubs was built in 1905 in Dublin, Ireland, my grandfather's clubs he gave me when I was 10 years wow. old. And they were hickory shafts. And I had a one wood driver. I had a two wood, the brassy. I had a three wood, which I think was called a spoon, and then a four wood. Uh, and so the, you you would use the two wood off the fairway on a really long par five to get a, maybe ten or fifteen more yards of distance compared to the three wood, and you would you would use it off the tee on tight, really tight fairway uh, par fours. But then over time, it kind of got dropped out of use of common usage, and that's kind of what a mini driver is. It's like a two wood basically. Right, right. That's yeah. what I understand. But I also understand that the technology that they've been able to incorporate into the old style two wood into today's technology with face control and whatnot, mm -hmm. um, and having a shorter shaft, right. that it might give you a good amount of distance off the tee, but a lot more control. Yep. And also, you can hit it off the deck if you're, you know, yep. going on a par five and you got a long second shot. Yeah, I think I didn't Mickelson put in the British Open about six or seven years ago. He put uh, it was some major, maybe it wasn't the Open, but it was some one of the four majors that he did win, if I remember right. And he had a he had a, a mini driver in the baggage, so he had two drivers basically, and it was considered radical at the time. But yeah, 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 yeah. So you're saying amateurs. Mid yeah. handicappers. No, definitely not. No, just learn to hit the driver well. You can always choke okay, down on a driver and make the shaft short. You can choke down an inch and turn it into a, or you know, three quarters of an inch or so, and turn it into a, basically a, a mini yeah, driver. Yeah, but in you a way. still have that four. You, you're going from what? Is, what's the maximum limit on the, on the driver head now? Is what four hundred sixty? Yeah, four sixty. Yeah. CCs. Yeah. Yeah, and and the mini driver is like three sixty, right. isn't it? Or four hundred or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's in the high 300s, yeah. 380 maybe. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I've been watching a lot of, you know, videos and trying to do some yeah. research on this because it fascinates me. It's like, oh, you mean I might be able to hit something but what I do the is, more often? When I have to hit a more accurate driver, and most good players I know do this, I choke down on the driver about three quarters of an inch. I put the ball back about a ball within my stance, and I tee it much lower, and I hit a stinger, a stinger driver. Oh, which is basically a three quarter backswing, three quarter finish. Um, you know, you tighten your grip pressure a little bit, so you get a little bit less wrist action. So you have more club face stability, and you have more shaffling. You get more forward shaffling when you do those things, and so you hit this super low shot. But if if, if you're playing in dry summer conditions, it'll roll out sometimes forty yards. Sure. So it's an accurate way. And you and if you do what I just said, you don't really lose, if you're an average amateur especially, that much distance. But you'll hit it straighter. I, I want to clarify. I'm mm -hmm. pleased with the driver I'm playing with right now. Yeah, yeah. And um and I'm and I'm, you know, but I'm not hitting every fairway. And of course, everybody yeah. wants to hit every fairway. Sure. And you know, you watch on uh, you watch on the weekends and they don't do that either. But so if if there's something that can give me more control, right, yep. and less less headache, yep. then sure, I'd want to incorporate that. Yep. And yours, I I love your suggestions. You can turn your driver sure. into into a mini driver, uh, and, and I'm going to give it air quotes a mini driver just by yeah. choking down a little bit, teeing it lower, playing and, it back, and firming up your grip pressure. Back. Um, huh. You could also start with your hands a little bit more forward, maybe an inch or two more forward shaffling at setup. So um, you're just trying to keep the ball low, yeah, which is also thing, the shot yeah. you want to do when it's really windy. Yeah, right? when it's windy, exactly. It's the same shot you do into a wind. But you're also basically, instead of hitting up on it a few degrees, which is optimal for when there's no wind or when there's wind, wind with you, for optimum launch angle and carry distance – you want to have the low point, instead of being, say, an inch and a half behind the ball, you want it to be at the very back of the ball. So the so the club head bottoms out right at the back of the ball. Yeah. Oop. 
Mm, as opposed to being on the up upswing. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. See, but what you wanted to talk about was how to hit the driver longer. Yeah, I could go over a couple of quick, you know, sort of simple bullet points on that that I see, particularly with mid to high handicap amateurs where they're losing yardage. Um, the first uh-huh. is most most people who are in that sort of eight or ha- eight handicap or higher range often don't understand that there are some significant differences in setup with driver than any other club in the bag. Really? Yeah. So one of them, obviously, you have your stance should be about at least two inches wider with your driver compared to your three wood. And sometimes people say, "Well, why do you? Why is the clubs get longer in general? Do you do you widen your stance?" And the answer is, as the clubs get longer, you're going to make a bigger pivot motion. The turning motion of your, and the tilting motion of your body gets bigger in range of motion, right? Mm-hmm. As the clubs get longer, and that's because with a driver. You're only going to have a spine angle at setup, you know, the angle of your torso to the ground of around 25 degrees or so. And compared to, say, a wedge where you might be like at 45 degrees, like a sand wedge or a lob wedge. And the more, the more bent over you are at setup because of the shorter club and the more upright lie angle on a wedge, the less you can turn. So when you're more, when you're more upright – you can make a bigger turn, which you need to do to cr- create more club head speed, right? But the problem is when you're more upright, uh, if you didn't know, if you, if you kept your stance width with a driver, the same stance width it would be on a wedge, you would, your, your head would be uh, probably, you know, uh, three inches too high, right? And so your, in other words, your center of gravity would be too high off the ground. So when you widen your stance, you're making your height shorter by several inches. And when you make yourself shorter in height, it's easier to swing in balance. Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it all makes sense. Um, as especially, I like the idea of widening your stance. I, I've Remember once hearing that maybe if you take your trail foot and angle it out a little bit with your yeah, that, wider stance, that's another your driver, yeah, does that, that help? Yeah, that gives you a bigger hip turn. If you get a, anytime you give yourself more hip turn, you can turn your shoulders more, right? Your shoulder girdle. Ah, yeah. I see what it is. So that's okay. another one. Uh, you want to have about ten percent more body weight on your right foot if you're a right-handed golfer with a driver. It's the only club in the bag where you would have more weight on your on your trail foot than on your lead foot. Really? Yeah. Oh, and another one is you want to tilt to the right that I teach, the model swing that I teach, somewhere between uh, – if you're not hitting the stinger, if you're hitting a normal driver where you want an upward launch angle, you know, up, upward angle of attack, you want to tilt your, your, your shoulder girdle 12 to 15 degrees to the right at setup. And that positioning of your – Tilting of your torso to the right, along with having a little bit more weight on your right foot, puts your sternum, which is called the upper swing center, where your spine and your shoulder girdle meet right here like a T, that positions your sternum at setup more or less where it should be at impact, Mm -hmm. right? Which is, you know, several inches behind the ball because the ball is going to be somewhere in the vicinity of your left heel. Where exactly? We can talk about it if you want, but it depends on how tall you are, right? So it varies if you're short, medium, or or tall in height. But basically for me, I'm six foot one. Uh, and I, I put the ball three inches inside to the right of my left heel with a driver. And I tilt my shoulders 12 degrees about like that. Here's this would be zero. That's about 12. And I have, I have a little bit more weight on my right foot. So I've got my sternum at setup where I want it to be at impact. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so those are the setup. Oh, well, you know, we've talked about T height in other podcasts. You obviously have to get the T height correct for your for your angle attack that you want, right? So right. you're going to vary the T height. If it's a, if it's a no win shot, it depends. I'll just t- to save time, I'll tell the listeners go back about a year ago. We did a podcast, and, and one of the things we talked about was hovering the driver versus soling it. Right. Oh, I I do not sole any clubs anymore, Good for especially you. my putter. Good for you. Yeah. Ever since that conversation, it's yeah. like, especially especially the putter because I always notice there's a little bit of drag and it turns the putter head when I yeah. have it sold That's on right. the ground. You know what I do so with the putter? I, a I tap. Inch. I tap four times as part of my automatic trigger ritual. 
I do four uh -huh. taps and then I do a little half inch forward press. That's my trigger for starting a putting stroke. But when I when I come up off the ground after that fourth tap, it kind of it almost bounces off the ground a little bit, off the putting surface, right? Uh -huh. That means I'm in effect I'm hovering. You know, the, the the sole of the putter is probably an eighth of an inch off the putting surface, something like that. Right. Right. Yeah. All right, now we're getting to side. Well, we'll get to putters later. Yeah. All but, right. So back to so those are a, the a adjustments, right? So the, then the other yeah, thing yeah. that people don't do is um, they don't turn all the way, which is like one of my big bugaboos as an instructor. People, people either are if they're a very high handicap, they kind of go like this with their arms and barely turn, right? Which is no, no, I, wait, wait. You say go like this. No one's watching us. Oh, okay. So I for, I forgot. Tell me yeah, what but, you, yeah, but it's, it's you, audio. Yeah. All right. So, so basically, for the for the for since there's no audio, then it's uh, no visual, rather. Uh, people just swing their upper arms around their body, if, especially if they're higher handicaps, like 18 handicaps or higher, and they ba they barely turn. They may they may rotate their shoulders like 50 degrees at best, right? So the first thing you got to realize is it's not an, you, in, in any golf swing, you don't swing your arms around your chest nearly as much as most people think, right? The arms stay in front of your chest and go up and down in a little V shape, right? So you've got to turn your torso, which, which basically means from your lower back all the way up to and including your shoulder girdle has to turn away from the target. So if you think of your torso as a door, and the door swings open 90 degrees typically, right? And mainly it's the left side. If you're right in a golfer, people don't turn their entire left side of their torso from their left shoulder down to their left waistline. They don't turn that as a unit away from the target behind them enough. They, turn, they do it a little bit, but they don't do it enough. So, so imagine if I said, if I was an archery instructor and you had a, you had a compound bow, like a professional level compound bow, and you're supposed to pull your hand back, let's call it uh, 24 inches to, to get maximum power on, on when you release it, right? When the arrow's released. Mm -hmm. And you only turned it back 10 inches. That's what high handicappers do. And the mid handicappers turn it back maybe 16 inches. And the low handicaps turn it back 20 inches. And the pros turn it back, turn, pull, pull the bow back 24 inches. They fully coil, right? That, and, and, yep. And, and the problem, the, the main reason why people don't do that, it's a scary feeling if, if you're a mid to high handicap amateur to rotate your entire torso to 90 to 100 degrees measured at the top of the torso, which is your shoulder girdle. It feels out of control to turn off away from the ball, away from the target line where the ball sits. And if that, is, if that induces a scary feeling like of loss of control, then you suffer from a common problem called steering impulse. Yeah. People who have steering impulse, their mind is frozen on, on the ball and on the target line. They don't like to make a big, deep turn away from it. Mm -hmm. So you have to be courageous and realize it's okay. It's okay to hit the ball offline, especially with the driver, right? Yeah. The, the, one of the main reasons why people hit it short is because they have steering. They may hit it straight, but they don't hit it long because they have steering impulse. So you got to make a big, full turn of your entire torso. And of course, your hips have to turn as well. And the the model is a minimum of 45 degrees of hip turn, maximum of 60 degrees. If, if you turn your hips 60 degrees and you're reasonably flexible and fit, not yogi-like, but just reasonably flexible, if you can turn your hips 60, you'll be able to turn your shoulder girdle at least 100 degrees to 105. Wow. Because you're not well, really, I, you're know, not turning. That's, an, really yeah, I, that's a really important point to make is that if you're flexible enough, I mean, there there's so many golfers that don't work on their flexibility right. or their that's mobility right. that, you know, you're, you're just not talking to them because mm -hmm. they can't. Well, here's what you need to know. If you're sitting in a chair like you are, like I, well, I'm, I'm sitting on my, my bed in my guest bedroom, but we'll call it a chair. The point I'm trying to make is if you turn your hips 45 degrees, which I'll do now, and mm -hmm. then all I got to do then is rotate my shoulders 45 degrees. Almost everybody has 45 degrees of shoulder girdle rotation. So if you had sure. 45 plus 45, that's 90. So in effect, you're, 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 a you're, you're attaining a 90 degree shoulder girdle rotation, even though in reality, half of that is from your hips rotating. Oh, wow. So in other words, okay. most people, 99% of golfers who think they're not flexible enough to do what I just said are indeed flexible enough. I've never seen a yeah. single player not be able to turn their shoulder girdle sitting in a chair without moving their hips at least 45 degrees. Anybody can do that. 
That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So that's a that's a big source of power. The bigger the coil you make, the the more potential energy you have on the downswing to to, to release into the back of the ball, right? Yeah. Uh, the other the other power leak is again, especially for mid to high handicaps, they don't fully set their wrist angles. They don't they don't fully cock their wrist. They, the average amateur that I work with, if their handicap is twelve or higher, they're only doing a half a wrist cock. So again, they get, that's another way of saying you're not you're not pulling the bow back all the way. Right, mm-hmm. and you know if you're if you don't have arthritis in your wrists and and you haven't injured or broken your wrist or, or any way, if you have if you have healthy wrists and your grip is correct, particularly your 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 lead hand, your left hand grip for a right hand golfer is correct, you should be able to form a ninety degree angle between. I could do more, so that would be ninety. I don't. So for people who are listening, Fred can see me, even though you won't be able to. But so that's ninety, right, Fred? So I can do 110. Yes. So this is with your lead hand. Yeah. This is your left hand yeah. for a right-handed golfer. That's actually more like 115. You know, Hogan's, Hogan's wrists were so flexible. This will blow your mind. He could take his left thumb, like I'm showing Fred. I'm, pull, I'm pulling my left thumb back toward my fore, the inside of my left forearm. He could touch his forearm. I'm about... I used to be able to do that. Seriously? I used to be able to. Well, yeah, when I was a kid, I used to be able to do. I can't do that. Ouch, yeah. that hurts. Okay, ow. Yeah, I'm so that was one reason that. for being a little guy. He had such incredible lag. He had such a big lag angle between his left arm and the club shaft. I think he was like at 120 degrees, 125 degrees, something insane like that. That's how he generated a lot of club head speed. Yeah. So you got to mm-hmm. cock, you cock your wrists all the way to generate force, right? Okay. And then the last yep. thing is you've got to be able to uh, synchronize, which we'll talk about. I think we'll have time to, in today's podcast. We'll go more in depth. You have to synchronize what your upper arms, how your upper arms swing and how your trail elbow folds and then how, it, how the trail elbow unfolds on the downswing and how the, how the upper arms swing down on the downswing. Mid to high oh, handicaps yeah, don't, don't do that, that part well at all. Yep. Say that again. That went by way too quick for me. Okay, so so you've got your upper arms at setup are resting on your chest, right? They okay. should be slightly yep. on top of your pec. So your tricep should be resting more on top than to the sides, right? And then as, as the swing proceeds, as you start your arm motion, which is not in towards you, but away from your chest, away from you as you rotate, right. but on an angle, a 45 degree angle measured at the left, at the lead arm to your chest, like so. That's the takeaway. And then the second half of backswing, your trail elbow should fold between 75 and 90 degrees, no more than 90. And so when you do that properly, your arms and your hands are in front of, if you're a right handed golfer, the right side of your chest at the top of the backswing, like a waiter holding a tray of food walking through the restaurant. Virtually nobody who's handicap is around eight or higher does that properly all the good players top amateurs and pros do it just like just like i showed you no exceptions and, and everybody who's at a handicap or higher is pulling pulling their hands in toward their body and around their rib cage this is part of my arm swing illusion stuff we've done a couple of podcasts on that a long time ago right but in other words people people who have the arm swing illusion operating in their unconscious mind swing blueprint or swing map will do this flaw that I'm talking about they pull their arms in toward themselves like starting a lawnmower and around their body now they're stuck so at the top of their yep. back swing their rib cage is blocking their arm swing on the way down hmm. yeah so that's a that's that is I think the really big deal in golf instruction when it comes to uh, the mechanics of the golf swing uh, so if you're doing that, you're never going to be able to release the club properly. And if you can't release the club properly, it means you're going to have basically, you know, slower than optimal club head speed. One of the things that Tony Manzoni talked about a lot is making sure that your your bicep kind of attaches to your pec. Well, right? actually not your, your bicep, your- but your tricep. Yeah. Well, right, but the, your upper arm. Let me just say, your upper arm correct. to be connected to your pec, your your chest, right. to your pec, right. not away from it. And there's this great video of Gary Player saying, "You don't want any," and he does this. You know, you don't want yeah. any space between yeah. your arm and your. Are we talking about the same thing? 
Well, that's part. That's the setup part of it. Yeah. In other words, if we talk, if we talk about uh, this major thing, which is a big deal, which is, which is, you know, I, I always use a teaching story. Years ago, when David Ledbetter was the number one teacher on the planet, he did a long interview with Golf Digest. And at the end of the interview, it was very technical. The journalist said, well, is there a simpler way to say this? What is it that you're trying to do with both your high handicap students and your tour pros? Is there a universal common denominator that you're trying to get everybody to do? And he goes, yeah, there is, which I happen to agree with. Here's what he said. He goes, it all boils down to this. How do you synchronize the arm motion with the pivot? That's, that's what's hard about the golf swing. And that's why mid to high handicaps struggle with basically bad ball striking because they're really bad at that skill. They don't have a good pivot. They don't have a good arm motion. And even if they did have a good arm motion and pivot, you still have to blend the two together. You have to synchronize it. And it has to be synchronized in real in reality, which is three-dimensional space, not 2D. Right? You got to be able to picture in 3D what, what am I supposed to do with my arms? What am I supposed to do with my, the, the elements of my pivot? And how do I sync them up? Because if, if you're, you can have both things really well independently, but if they aren't blended together properly, you're going to hit really bad golf shots. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I like that. And again, most people now, pull their arms in so they don't have a good arm motion. I mean, the amount of arm motion, I'll, I'll, I'll talk, talk myself through it so your listeners can see it, but can understand it and visualize it. But you, you can, I'll show you, Fred, since you can see me. All, all, all you can do, all, all you have to do is, is move your hands. If you, if you use the end of your arms, i.e. your hands, as, as a way of measuring what the arms do. I'm, and I'm, for the audience who can't see me, I'm not going to pivot. I'm going to literally not turn my body or tilt my, my spine at all. So there's going to be zero pivot. All that happens is the hands move in front of your body on a slight angle to the right, about six inches, and that's it. And the elbows don't bend. Neither elbow bends. The wrists start to cock a little bit while you're doing that and hinge. And then the second half of backswing, your trail elbow folds, which raises your lead arm about eight or 10 inches, maybe a bit more if you're very flexible. So that's it. That's all, that's all the independent arm motion there is on the backswing, right? Hmm. But there's also dependent arm motion, which basically means when you, when you pivot, the pivot motion of your body also moves your arms kind of in a spiral shape. So we call that pivot dependent arm motion as opposed to the first example, which is independent arm motion or arm muscles moving the arms versus pivot moving the arms. Right, but the again, the average person who plays golf is super, super armsy. They're, they got weight. They got four times as much independent arm motion as a tour pro, and that mm-hmm. absolutely causes poor club head speed, particularly with the driver. Hmm. So that's a big one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I and I personally want to just say one more time, and probably pound this way too much, but. Yeah, I, there's this program that we advertised a couple of years ago on the podcast called Dynamic Golfers, yep. and I still use it every day. It's only like 15 to 18 minutes of flexibility, mobility, mm-hmm. you know, work. And as we get older and we spend more time sitting around um, and doing a lot less activity, we lose a lot of that mobility. And I really can't emphasize enough how important that all is if you want to improve your golf. Oh, no question. Yeah, you know? I do. And then, yeah, go ahead. Say, you I probably do, um, do yoga. On the days I'm not teaching uh, in person, because as you know, I'm doing a ton of webcam lessons, but they don't start till about noon my time on the West Coast. So from, I wake up at seven, and in that five hour period of time, uh, almost four hour, I do a three hour and 45 minute workout, and about. Wow. Almost two hours of that is mobility and flexibility exercises every day. Wow. Yeah. And I'm pretty and how far do you drive the ball? How, what's that? How far do you drive the ball? Uh, I, you know, as you know, because we, we've been together, I, I've had chronic low back issues off and on for my whole career. So when I'm healthy, which is sure. not as often as I was like at age 73, uh, I can, my average carry is 235 to 255 carry with 20 yards of roll in the summer. 
Wow. So 255 to 275. And, and, you know, we talk about changing clubs, mm-hmm. putting on different shafts, yep. getting a bigger head, you yep. know, getting fit, uh, finding the right ball and using a ball and the right tee, all these different things. But really, if you want to increase your distance, don't you have to increase your muscles? Don't you have to become stronger? I mean, and because it's all about swing speed. Uh, yes and no. The, Isn't it? Y- yes, because obviously the, the Shambo is the perfect modern example. A guy who was, you know, he was a long driver before he changed his body. But he took he basically took almost a year off and just worked on strength training and came back. Yeah, he, he had, talks now. I, he talks now about that he overdid it and he went back. That's right. He did overdo not, it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. But the point he, is, he, he, his, his driving distance went up, like, I think by some insane amount, like 30 or 40 yards total distance in, in less than a year. Yeah. But yeah. so that is one way, don't get me wrong, being stronger. But then I always counter with, you know, I've spent a lot of time because not anymore, but up, up until about uh, three or four years ago, where I teach in the winter at Coalina Golf Club on the island of Oahu, uh, they had the, uh, I think it was the first or second. LPJ event of the of the of the of the season was there, so I got to spend a lot of time on the range watching these gals hit balls, right? And some of these LPGA pros are tiny; they're not big, they're not tall, they don't have long arms, long and they're not and they're not muscular, and they're carrying driver out there, you know, in anywhere from two thirty to two sixty, like Suzanne mm. Patterson, right? She's pretty long, or um, or Lexi Thompson, right? But they do this ten hours a day. Yeah, so I this is their that's job. The te- but that's the technique part. Their technique is great. They don't have. In other words, if your technique yeah. is sound, you don't have to be strong with muscles. Yeah, but how do you increase swing speed? Is my question. Well, that's kind of what we're talking. about. Other than the strength yeah. which you brought up, you have to have better technique. Uh, I see. The, the greatest example is a non-golf example. Um, I think you know I got involved in, in Asian martial arts at a very young age, and I was at a t- famous, now famous. You can you can even you can go online and find it on YouTube. I think this is in 1964, 65 in Chicago. Um, there was a, a couple, kind of like a like a global summit of it was one of the first martial arts uh, kind of summits, or it was a tournament, but it was also like people demonstrating their their art and their skill. Bruce Lee was there. I got to see Bruce Lee when I was 11 years old perform, which was unbelievable. Yeah, you've talked about that. Yeah. And so they had, I forgot who it was, but it was some Japanese, you know, like sixth or seventh degree black belt. And he's got a stack of roofing tiles. The roofing tiles are, are, are like ceramic tiles that are about maybe a half inch thick or a little bit more. And I think there was something like 15 of them stacked from the ground up. Right. And he had to stand on like a box or something because he wasn't, he was only like five foot four or five, five, a little guy, not, not muscular. Right. He does a, mm. he does a knife hand strike, what people co- colloquially call a karate chop, right. With the edge of your hand. Right. And he, he broke, I think it was 15 or 20 roofing tiles with one, one knife hand strike. <laughs> I mean, not, you can't, you can't explain <laughs> it in muscle because he wasn't a big guy. It's technique. Mm-hmm. So in, in karate, it's all about speed not about brute force. In boxing, it's a combination of speed and brute force because in boxing, partly because of the, the, the gloves you wear, but also the nature of the strike. In boxing, particularly if you're doing a body blow, you want you want a lot of time. You want the contact time between your boxing glove and the guy's solar plexus to be fairly long. So there could be an energy transfer. So the more energy you transfer from your fist into the opponent's body, the more the more punishing the blow. But in in Mason martial arts, it's exactly the opposite. You make a quick strike, almost like a snake that strikes and then recoils back. So it's mm-hmm. it's not it's not mass, it's speed, it's velocity, not mass. It's always a blend of both, obviously. But in the Asian martial arts tradition, it's more about. In other words, if you if you have a, a a fist and an arm that weighs, say, I think the average adult male's arm, each arm weighs around ten or eleven pounds. So let's say you have a ten pound arm. So that's the mass, along with some of the mass of your body, because obviously they're connected. But let's just say, let's just for as a thought experiment, keep it to the weight of the arm. 
and that arm is moving at 50 miles an hour, it's going to do some damage, right? But if the same arm is moving at 150 miles an hour, it's going to do a lot more damage, right? And that, so golf, the golf swing is more like Asian martial arts than, than Western boxing in terms of application of force. It's more about speed. It's not about application of, of mass. So there's a great thought experiment I use in all my coach. I don't think we've ever talked about this before because a common flaw, and again, this is a reason, one reason why amateurs don't hit the ball far enough, especially with the driver. I came up with this 20 years ago. I asked people. Uh, back then I used, I think I used, who was I using at the time? Whoever the longest driver was 20 years ago. Well, it probably would have been Tiger. Tiger. Yeah. I, uh, but but now I say Roy McIlroy because pound for pound, Roy McIlroy is the longest driver on the planet. Pound for pound, right? Yeah. Right. So I say, right. okay, here's the thought experiment. You got Roy McIlroy hitting his driver. You got exactly the same driver with, with the same shaft, right? And, and well, well. But let's let's even make it easier. Let let's suppose you've got you're you're an amateur golfer, but your swing speed is 95 miles an hour or or more, because if it's less than 95, you're going to have to use a regular shaft, not a stiff flex like he's using. So you have the same flex, the same length of driver. Let's call it 46 inches. Same driver head. Same total weight. Same grip. Everything's the same with the driver. And the thought experiment was: there's Roy McIlroy. I think his average carry. When he, when he goes after it, tries to rip it, is about 320-ish in the air, right? Yeah, I was going to say 310 to yeah, 315, yeah. something yeah. like that. Um, and let's call it, I think, I'm pretty, I think he's averaging, when he goes after it, around 125 miles an hour club bed speed, right? Wow. Okay. So I tell people, I go, all right, so he's hitting a golf ball. There's a locomotive with... 20 boxcars trailing it. So way more mass than the mass in Roy McElroy's driver. Same driver is bolted to the side of the locomotive, right? And they're both going to be traveling 125 miles an hour when the ball is contacted. Which ball goes further? Nine out of 10 people will tell me the locomotive will hit the ball further. And I ask him, why do you think that? And they go, because they go, because the locomotive weighs more than Roy McElroy, because it weighs more, because it's going to transfer some of its mass down the shaft into the club head into the ball. And I go, not true. Why isn't it true? Because the ball bounces off the club face. It only stays on the club face for one half of one thousandth of a second. There's not enough time for that mass of the locomotive to go down the shaft into the ball. Huh. Does that make sense? In other no. words, the, the only thing the only thing that makes the ball go is the club head speed. Of course, I'm assuming right. center face contact, obviously, and proper angle attack. Yeah, right, right. right, right. It, it does, there's no mass transfer. You don't transfer the mass of your body. But one of the flaws that, that I see mid to high handicap do is we call it a body lunge. I often call it sacking the quarterback. People, people will actually transfer their upper body weight laterally, like, you know, slide, I'm, for the listeners, I'm sliding my – my chest about eight inches forward toward the target. They think if I go mm -hmm. like that and lunge toward the toward the target, that that energy of me lunging will transfer down the shaft into the club into the ball, and that does not happen at all. At all. Yeah, the ball bounces off yeah. instantly. The only thing that matters is how fast the club bed's moving. There is no, there is no mm -hmm. mass transfer in golf like there is in, in, wow. in boxing where you're where you're. Where your fist stays, it doesn't, you know, the fist is penetrating the body and staying in contact longer. So the only thing that matters, is, again, assuming you have center face contact, is how fast the club head's moving. And the analogy, the better analogy would be if you understand how a whip master makes a bullwick, the, the, the very tip, the last quarter inch of, the, of a, say, like a 20 foot long bullwhip goes over 800 miles an hour and cracks the sound barrier, which is about, makes that loud sound, right? Right. That's what happens in golf. It's much more like cracking a whip. Hmm. And so that's why the technique is more important than how strong you are. This is all way too interesting um, <laughs> and a lot to absorb. That's yeah. what I love about podcasts. You get to go back and listen to it again and go, oh, that's what he meant. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can you hear it again and again and again? Yeah. It's good. I want to I want to make a little bit of a pivot here. Uh um, uh, on, on content and, and talk about your specialty, the yips. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, as we're recording this tomorrow morning, I'm driving to Eugene, Oregon 
to go play two rounds of golf, hopefully two, with Sam Hahn, CEO of Lab Golf. Mm -hmm. yep. And we're going to record our conversations, but also we're going to record, he's going to hopefully give me um, a, a tutorial on this putter that they just sent to me. Um, again, I'm, it's the DF3, which I've been playing. I don't want to get into too much detail because we'll do it in the next episode or maybe the last. Uh, but I went with a broomstick. I've been fascinated by the broomstick because what I've noticed, and, you know, we've seen Lucas Glover, who had the yips for years, yep. couldn't putt, but was able to maintain his his uh, card and stay on tour because he was a great ball striker, but his putting was horrendous. Switched over to a lab golf putter, uh, broomstick and won two weeks in a row, and now Lab Golf has exploded. And yeah. every video that you see online that talks yeah, about big, these putters, it's big time right now. They're just, yeah, yeah they're going nuts. And yeah. I just, I couldn't be happier for Sam, and I can't wait to just give him a big hug and say, Congratulations, dude. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. Um, but one of the things that I've noticed, and the, the putter arrived day before yesterday, and I've been able to put an hour or so into getting some practice with it and, and get the feel of it. Um, one of the things that I've noticed about my putting uh, misses is too much, it, it, it controls from the left hand, mm -hmm. whether I'm pushing it or I'm pulling it, um, or on my takeaway, if it's, if it's not sold onto the ground, if it's, you know, if I'm just dragging yep. it off the ground, yep. it'll, it'll turn and stuff. And immediately I've noticed that taking my left hand out of the punting motion with the broomstick has allowed me to stay on the line that I'm pointing down much better. I know the lab putter will do yeah, that it too. Yeah, tends to do it, yeah. But I'm able to stay on, on the line that I want it. Yep. So I'm curious to ask you about the impact of broomstick putters on the yips. Well, that's a great question, Fred. Uh, it, I'll just tell you the, the generic answer is if someone has moderate, because if you have mild putting yips, most people can kind of figure it out by maybe just changing their grip. They go from standard reverse overlap, palms neutral to say left hand low. If it's a mild case, that usually fix it. But if it's a moderate to severe case, anything you do to change your technique from mechanics to grip to setup to grip pressure to putter, or even the style of grip, you know, the actual grip you put on the end of the putter, has a proven track record for helping. Um, generally, one, one, or, one or more of those things isn't enough to completely eliminate the yips because once you have the yips, it's, in terms of how the yips work, it's 100% it's psychological, not mechanical, not physical, right? Once you have mm -hmm. them. Um, but... Mm -hmm. but Changing how the mechanics work will impact the psychology part in kind of a backdoor mm. kind of kind of an indirect way. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, change, going changing from what, a standard length putter, say like a standard like a you know like a Scotty Camera blade putter, and going to a bigger head like a like a tailor made spider, or or like the lab putter, uh, particularly the lab putter because clearly it's a superior technology because it's it it's it's not impossible. It's more difficult to rotate the face open or shut during the forward stroke. And I think that's the main advantage. So again, anything you yeah, can Yeah. And if you're hitting it off the toe or off the heel, yeah. it's going to go right on the, the intended line, yeah, which is exactly. really amazing. It's, so the, basically the face is more stable just before, during, and after impact compared to a, a typical putter, like a face balance putter or a heel toe putter, or, you know, the, that type, the traditional type of blade putter. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it's great technology. It makes absolute perfect sense to me. Um, so yes, it would definitely help someone with yips and not, and not just the, you know, not just the lab putter technology itself, but going to a different style, like, like you're doing where it's completely radically different, which is the broomstick is about, a, about as radically different as you can make it. Yeah. yeah. That, that will help with the yips because the yips are dependent on what is called a, neuromuscular pathway between brain and muscles that's to some degree a dominant habit and you have a memory of you have an associated memory with doing that style of putting with yipping but when you use a radically different type of putter or a radically different grip on the, like for example a thicker grip on the end right 
or or how you position your hands on the putt are radically different. Like say left hand low, split hand left hand low would be a radical change. You've never yipped in, in the case of the, of the of the theoretical golfer with yips. You've never yipped a putt ever with this strange feeling grip, or with this strange putter mm-hmm. in your hands, or this strange technique. And so, in the short term, it will absolutely inhibit any tendency to yip. Hmm. Okay. And, you know, one of the things, they, they changed the rules about broomstick putters a couple of years right. ago, right? About anchoring. Yeah, can't, you can't anchor it anymore. So anchoring basically means you cannot have your uh, hand, I guess your left hand, your lead hand, yep. touching your body. Correct. You, can't, you used to anchor it to the top of your sternum. and you can't, Now you have to have at least a little bit of space there. Right. Yep. Okay. But it still gives you, I mean, you could still hold your left hand, your lead hand steady and get a really good pendulum motion mm-hmm. with just one hand. Sure. Yeah. I mean, but anchoring is concern, definitely easier for let's, let's not quibble about it. I mean, anchoring is a superior way of doing it for all kinds of reasons, but we can't do it that way anymore. So it's a non-starter, right? Right. Yeah. Right. Because what happens, I mean, the, the the USGA and the RNA, they uh, they kind of have a history of this. But if somebody starts winning with something, they'll go, "Okay, that's now illegal." Well, you know, right? the supreme example they, of that, the, they did that with the wedges. No, there's a, right? there's one that goes they, back even further, which is, in fact, I, a friend of mine was involved in this a guy named Don Iverson, who was a, a, my fellow assistant coach at Portland State University on the golf team. He went to wow. uh, University of Portland when he was in college. And he invented the first croquet putter where you putted between your legs. And he was making, he, he, he almost, he rarely missed inside 15 feet putting croquet style. This is oh, back wow. in the early 60s. He's, he won a college tournament at Riverside Golf Club in Portland. And the low, the, at that time, the, you know, that era's version of today's Peter, ja- you know, Peter Jacobson's the famous pro from Portland, right? So, Peter Jacobson back then in the late 50s, early 60s, was a guy named Bob Duden. And he happened to be there attending this college tournament. And he sees Don putting and making everything. And he had the yips. Bob had the yips at the time. And he was, it was hurting his career. He wasn't making any, any cuts on tour. So he tried it out and he starts making everything. So, so Don makes him a putter for himself. He goes out on tour and starts, I don't think he won with it, but he, he did, you know, he was, had a lot of top 10 finishes. He was pretty good friends with Sam Snead. Snead had the putting yips at the at sort of toward kind of like to the middle ish, not quite at the end of his career, but sort of like the last, uh, you know, between the middle and the end of his career. In that last part of his of his career, he started suffering off and on with a pretty bad case of the yips. So he tries it. He starts making everything. He won the first tournament. He used it. He won it on the PJ Tour. And, about, and, and I started putting with it because I thought, well, if it works for Sammy Snead, I'll try. I, I, I putted with it. Six months later, the tour board made it illegal. And then the USGA followed. <laughs> so you're right. They have oh, a tendency man. when people find something that works really well, they ban it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm just so concerned about the technology that Lab has developed, that Bill Pressey developed on the DF, yeah. uh, the Directed Force 2.1, that um, – God, it would just be terrible if they go, okay, if you're the only one making this putter and it's working for so many people, we're not going to allow that anymore. Yeah, I, I'm just terrified that I don't happen. think they'll do it because as long as the putting stroke itself is considered traditional, because golf's very tradition bound sport, right? That's what mm, a lot of the rules yes, are based on tradition. Yes. I think it, you're still using a normal grip and you're doing a normal putting stroke, more or less. I don't, I don't see how they could possibly justify banning it. I really don't. Oh, they don't need justification. They just oh, do they it. I do mean, it. why did they – they changed it with the wedges, yeah, right? The groove. That's true. Yeah. What, what, what was so, you know, different about those that they were like, uh, yeah, no, you can't well, have those I'll grooves tell you anymore. How that it's giving about. you too much because, spin. Because those U-grooves, when they first came out in the market, I think Ping, and Ping was the first company to make it. It was – in other words, the edges of the U-grooves were so sharp compared to the traditional V-shaped grooves – that tour pros who used to hit flyers out of the rough, right? Like out of the light rough where they would get right. the grass juice 
forming a film, a liquid film between the face and the cover of the ball. So the ball would fly 10, 20, 10, 15 yards further in the air, right? And they would, you know, they'd have, they'd have at least sometimes doubling the hole because they'd, they'd hit it 20 yards over the green, right? All of a sudden, they're not doing that. They're getting spin on it. And so that mm-hmm. was the main justification that it was changing the game at that level too radically for the, for the top players. So that kind of, you can kind of see the argument there on that one, but. Yeah, I just, I just, I think it's random. Oh, well. All right, Jimmy. Well, listen, all, as always, I love these conversations and, and how many different directions they can go <laughs> in, in just 45 minutes. Uh, but it's always an education. It's always entertaining. And I can't wait till we do it again for your 240th. You know, we episode. should do one on, on, a, on the coming impact of the AI revolution on the, on the game of golf because it's, I think 20 years from now we'll have AI-brained robots – that will be carrying the ball 400 yards in the air with the driver. And, and the game will be, you, you design your own robot and you, and, and you're the caddy and you tell the robot, you know, what club to pick and where to aim. And the robot does the game for you. I can see that happening. Um, uh, um okay. <laughs> that was a little bit tongue in cheek, Fred, just uh, a, just a tad. But, yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. No, there, there's actually this incredible tech reviewer named Marquise Brownlee. And who uh, just kind of came out that he's also been a lifelong golfer, um, but he's he's an incredible tech reviewer and really popular. And he just did a whole thing on the impact that uh, AI is already having on professional golf. Oh, interesting! It's a great video. I'll uh, I'll, I'll put a link to that. It's really interesting, um, and that's because when we're watching on television how we can see the ball flight. And it's not a random, you know, red streak going where the ball is. It's actually what's going on. And there are people and technology all throughout the course with TrackMan, of course, um, giving them up to the, you know, like within seconds, the details of exactly what the ball is doing and where it's going to land. And they can predict where it's going to land before it does. It's it's really remarkable. And if you have, you know, the Apple Vision Pro, you can watch a tournament with multiple screens going on and feel like you're right. Anyway, tech geek stuff. Love it. Find it. Marquise Brownlee on, on uh, AI could, and golf. Could I do two quick plugs? I would love that. Even though, you know, I hate marketing. This is me. This is my simple. Business. But I, you're on my podcast, man, <laughs> and it's all about the marketing. Go. I yeah. want to hear more about it. Uh, two things. Well, I'll start with the, with the, back to the topic of, of today's podcast, which is well, one of the topics, which is how to hit the ball longer off, uh, off the tee. I have a, a video. I've had it on my website for, I don't know, five years. It's called Explosive Power. It's long. It's about, I think it's two and a half hours. It's a long one. But I go through every single element of how to increase club head speed, make more center face contact to hit the ball further with the driver. And it's one of our awesome. best sellers on the videos. So that's one plug. The second plug is if you have yips, anybody listening who has yips yourself, or you know, somebody who has yips, there is hope. I work with more golfers with yips than anybody else on the planet. That's a certainty. And I have a very high success rate and it's only getting better as I'm learning more and more about what works and what doesn't work and helping people overcome the yips. And I've got this, my biggest success so far, um, I'm, I worked with a guy a year and a half ago in Hawaii who, when he was in high school, was the number one ranked junior in the country. And he was playing, at the time, he was playing with people like Scotty Scheffler and beating them, right? But very slowly, starting in senior year, he started getting full swing yips. And then he got a full ride to an Ivy League school, was the number one player in the Ivy League school's golf team. The yips slowly got worse over time. It got so bad by the end of his junior year, he had to quit the team. He couldn't, he couldn't play hmm. and he eventually quit golf. Hmm. Uh, and he contacted me about uh, a little over a year and a half ago. And he came out to Hawaii and worked with me at Koalina Golf Club for three days. And uh, he is now, by, by the way, at the time, he, he would only yip on the golf course, not, on, not ever on the range. And he was hitting the ball so solid and so far was such a great looking swing that everybody on the range would stop and just stare at him. Um, 
Even then, when he still had the yips, although, again, not on the range, he would have been ranked one of the top 10 ball strikers in the world. That's how good the guy was. Um, and he, he shared with me that he played a, a – he played a, a he played at the, you don't know, Fred, the Presidio in San Francisco from the tips hmm. uh, a week before he came out. And the yips were so bad. I think he shot 110. Hmm. So imagine being one of the top 10 ball strikers in the world and shooting 110. That's how, that's how devastating the yips can be to someone's wow. golf game. So uh, it didn't happen right away. It took him a few months. He had to go home and do a lot of practice. But he started seeing some significant improvement in the reduction of the yips by the end of the third month after he returned home. Um, and he contacted me about six months ago. He's back then it's actually trending, trending down. He was a zero handicap. Um, he'll be probably a plus three by the end of the uh, end of the year. That's amazing. So there is hope even for a severe case like that, it's possible to overcome the yips. Amazing. Incredible story. Yeah. And you can find that all at balancepointgolf.com. Correct. Awesome. Jimmy, thanks so much, man. It's always great to talk to you. Thanks, Brad. Have me on again, and we'll do do episode 3095. (laughs) So as I mentioned during our conversation, I'm headed up to Creswell, Oregon tomorrow to get a tour of the Lab Golf Factory. Then I'll have Sam Hahn give me a tutorial on the best way to take advantage of my new broomstick putter and play a round or two with Sam at his home course, Emerald Valley Golf Club. It's in Creswell, Oregon, just outside of Eugene. And if everything works properly, I'll record an episode while we're playing and hopefully create some video of that tutorial. Stay tuned for that one, and I will personally keep my fingers crossed. I hope your golf season is in full swing and you're playing better than ever. I'd like to thank this week's Golf Smarter Ambassador Dave Giango from Yuba City, California, who recorded his show opening on his phone in order to get a free link to Tony Manzoni's video of The Lost Fundamental. And now I'd like to invite you to also become one of our featured Golf Smarter Ambassadors and introduce a future episode. And when you do, you'll have a choice of three great free gifts, including Tony's video a new glove and glove storage compartment from redroostergolf.com, or a box of Flight Path Golf Tees, the most impressive tees you'll ever use, from flightpathgolf.com. All you need to do to get your free gift is write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com, and I'll get back to you with some simple instructions on what to do and what to say. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for upcoming episodes, please write to golfsmarterpodcast at gmail.com or just click on the Hey Fred button when you visit golfsmarter.com.